look, uh, there's real concerns about inflation right now, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. And basically all the big kind of global macro guys are, are saying that. Um, none of them are saying buy Bitcoin. The prevailing narrative that Bitcoin is a store of value is the only narrative, and that is failing. In, in, in a world where we've seen $2 trillion printed overnight by the US government. And so I've been thinking, you know, in the event that the Bitcoin doesn't break out and act, actually become modern digital gold, um, what what else could all of this kind of play out? Something else fills the gap. Because if there is demand for a global currency, a global payment rail, settlement rails, and Libra can fill that gap, and people want that, then that's where it's gonna go. What's up, YouTube? My name is Jackson. Today, I'm joined by co-founder of Multicoin Capital, Kyle Samani, and CEO of Civic, Vinny Lingam. How's it going today, guys? Hey, how are you, Jackson? Great to be on the show. Great. Hey, Jackson, good to be on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on, guys. So let's get started. Kyle, you are the co-founder and managing partner of a crypto investment firm. And Vinny, you made the first ever Bitcoin investment on South Africa's Shark Tank. How do you search for companies to invest in in the crypto space? Yeah, so, you know, we do a lot. Of, I mean, broadly speaking, there's in two ways to make investments, inbound and outbound. So on the inbound side, you know, we pretty are, we've written our, our kind of three mega theses on our website. We've published those and shared them with the world, hoping that obviously companies that, you know, if they whatever they're doing fits in one of those theses, it should kind of be obvious that we were a good fit. Um, and we generally make a, a pretty uh, concerted effort to be engaged in the community on, online, going to events. Um, sharing our thought leadership so that you know we can send signals to the entrepreneurs out there that hey, these are the, these are how we think and, and why we think these ways, and that if you're building something that is aligned and, and how we think, then you should reach out to us. Um, and that's been a very effective practice in, over the last couple of years. Um, so that kind of covers the, the inbounds. Um, on the outbound side, you know, we internally just like we obviously we were reading and thinking and learning all the time, and occasionally we got to have a conversation internally where we're like, hey, like this is a big opportunity let's go find a team. And when that happens, then we will start usually systematically just like calling everyone we know, looking at all the companies tangentially, you know, in, in that space and trying to kind of try and find an, oh, the, the right company to really express that view. Um, and we've been fortunate to do that now in, in a couple of different instances. Vinny, so I'm curious, how do you uh, appraise a company startup token or project you're thinking about investing in? Is there a, cert a set of criteria that you use that helps you know when you look at that company that that's the company I want to be invested in? Look, everyone's different and everyone has their own sort of mental models for how they look at these things. My personal one is I look at the founder, the team and what they've done before and sort of the history and past and the area of expertise. Um, and, and that for me is the most important thing because in the startup world, when you're going in really early, Things are going to change. It's going to be pivot after pivot. It's going to be, you know, uh, it's, it's just there, there's so much variability, right, in the tech world, and the, the industries are so volatile as it is. So it's always about the team. Can they stick together? Will they weather through? The, will they keep fighting for survival? And then once that's once it's cleared that, that hurdle, okay, what problem is this team trying to solve? And do I believe they have the background and the technical expertise to go and do it? And often I find that they have the passion but not the technical expertise. And I always advise them, go find the technical co-founder, find someone who can help you build this. And those are the things I – because I'm an early stage guy. I'm a you know, Series A, C type investor. Um, I, I want to just – I want to back the team to go get it done. Kyle, what does your criteria look like? Are there any specific or key indicators that you keep an eye out for? Yeah, so as many kind of suggested, every investor is different in how they prioritize things. Um, and, and that certainly varies across stages. Um, I'd say at both myself and Tushar, my, my co-founder, we are very, very focused on market um, and really understanding the size of the market, the existing players, uh, you know, wedges to kind of build a footing in them. How can, can, you, can you build a footing? Um, and what's kind of your asymmetric insight about, about that? Um, and those are the things we spend the majority of our time and effort on is really, really focused on market. Once we get comfortable with the market, then we really, really own on the founders because at the end of the day, we're going to be working with these people for a long time. Um, and so getting comfortable that they are, you know, they have the right founder market fit to pull it off. But the more time I spend investing, the more time I, I really uh, value the, the, the importance of founder market fit because it, being a founder is really hard. And like, if you don't have the right, story and context for why you're doing what you're doing uh you're gonna you're gonna give you're gonna give up eventually you're gonna have challenges along the way and so making sure that we really understand what's motivating the founder 
to pull that off is, is kind of our next big thing after we really understand the market structure. Mm-hmm. And we, we, I mean, we saw a lot of projects, especially in 2018, and I guess that sort of tapered out in 2019. How do you see the number of crypto startups and crypto projects? Uh, how has that number evolved over the past few years and where is it now, Kyle? Yeah, so I'd say that the, on an absolute basis, sure, the number of companies has, has decreased from the peak, which would probably call it mid-18. But um, I, I, the, there was just a lot of, of noise in that, in that, so I don't kind of put too much value on that. Um, today, the number of, of teams is lower, or new teams, I should say, is lower, but there's generally higher quality signal teams. The people who have bothered to stay in crypto through this time or who have gotten interested in crypto even after the crash, are typically the kinds of founders you want to back. Um, and, and so the, the signal to noise ratio has, has increased quite a bit. Do, do you agree with that, Vinny? Uh, yeah, I, I think so too. I, I always like on Twitter, I've always spoken about the tourists, you know, people who come into the industry when it's hot and when it, when it fizzles out and they just leave. Um, and then when they, you know, and then, then they realize everything's taken off and they want to get back in again. And we haven't got to the point where they want to get back in again. But the same thing happened in the dot com era. You had people like quitting their jobs as teachers at schools and firemen and policemen all jumping in to start companies in the dot com era. Like literally, this, these are famous stories. Same thing happened in 2017, where people who had no business being in this industry in tech were coming into this this tech industry and they were like people from social media and whatever else trying to become technologists in a tech startup and and they just can't easily contribute and the moment things get tough they go back to what they're used to doing what they know how to do well and that is definitely what's happened here because we've seen a, a, a we saw a huge influx of people and then we saw, saw them all leave and the people who are st- still behind the guys who are still sticking it out through the tough times like myself kyle the founders that we back etc these are the guys who are actually going to build the future uh, in in the day because they stuck out through the hard times where because it doesn't get easy it gets harder and if you're not willing to stick it out then you just don't have the passion for the industry and then you should go to the industry you do have passion for mm-hmm. so let's let's switch away from talking about the crypto space and let's talk more about crypto itself Kyle, you recently tweeted, what if the ultimate use case for crypto is not non-sovereign money, but just global payment rails in which all assets are bare assets? What role do you think crypto will play in the future of the global economy, Kyle? Yeah, so, you know, one thing that that's right now is a really interesting time to think about crypto. If you a lot of the, the kind of quarterly and monthly hedge fund letters that are the big global macro funds are coming out now. So. Um, Bridgewater, uh, Oak Tree, Elliott, a lot of these guys, and a pretty common theme you're seeing through all of them is they're saying, look, uh, there's real concerns about inflation right now, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. And basically all the big kind of global macro guys are, are saying that. Um, none of them are saying buy Bitcoin. Uh, and so that that is a little concerning right now, saying is like, look, like this is almost certainly the largest kind of inflationary, this is likely to be the largest inflationary crisis of the last 100 years or maybe the last 50 years and people are saying buy gold not buy bitcoin even though bitcoin in our view is objectively better than gold at, at actually being a store of value for all kinds of reasons and so um that, that's a little concerning and, and so i've just been thinking through well what if this just doesn't break through I mean, gold's been around for thousands of years and so it's just very hard to break that amount of inertia and so i've been thinking you know in the event that the bitcoin doesn't break out and act- actually become modern digital gold um, what what else could all of this kind of play out? And the, and the next kind of, I'd say, very obvious, very, very large market is in using just the crypto payment rails to uh, just facilitate large-scale global commerce and payments. Um, and so Libra is probably the, like, the strongest instantiation of this, um, where they're saying, look, like we're going to take this, this, this technical framework that like crypto really pioneered with public key cryptography, with an open ledger, with all these things, uh, by making assets a bare asset, and we're just going to focus on scaling that out to support billions of people uh, and make it as cheap as, uh, as possible to, to make payments work around the world um, and then to kind of enable smart contracts on top of that. Um, and, and that to me is a is a uh, although it's not the same, it's, it's a very distinct vision from just digital gold for everybody. Um, it, it is a still a massive scale vision with a strong, strong focus on enabling people to to change how they interact with money. Um, and I, I think a lot of the crypto people who are just digital gold bugs. Are, are kind of missing the missing that just different framing. Mm-hmm. Um, Vinny, if 
Bitcoin continues to fail as this digital goal, do you see this outcome uh, as occurring as well? Well, I mean, uh, we say the outcome of pe people using alternative currencies as a rails. Yeah, I, mean, I think yeah. that's what I've been saying for years. I said if Bitcoin can't scale, Lightning Network doesn't exist, it can't really scale. I mean, it's no way, right? After three years of waiting, it was supposed to be ready, you know, 18 months time back in 2015. So Lightning's not working. Uh, there's no way to scale Bitcoin for it to become a payment rail. So the, the, the prevailing narrative that Bitcoin is a store of value is the only narrative, and that is failing. In, in, in a world where we've seen $2 trillion printed overnight by the U.S. government, governments around the world creating money, and printing, but Bitcoin's failing to rally, not even like to its January highs. Forget its all-time highs, right? Um, so this is, this is a big problem, I think, uh, that, that, that the narrative, because like the, I, don't, I never bought the narrative of digital gold, but I do buy the narrative that Bitcoin could be a global, global payments rails, but that would mean the block size increases, et cetera, which nobody wants to do in the community. So it's stuck in this sort of store of value hypothesis. Um, so what happens? Something else fills the gap. Because if there is demand for a global currency, uh, global payment rails, settlement rails, and Libra can fill that gap, and people want that, then that's where it's going to go, because ultimately utility is going to drive value. And so if there, if there is utility moving money cheaply around the world, and, and there is a, a alternative services that can do it, uh, it's going to take off. So to the large extent, I, I agree with Kyle on that. I will say, though, I do disagree uh, around what the inflationary aspects of the money printing ha that has been happening is, right? Because what's really happening is the, the U.S. dollar is gaining in its, in its dominance, right, in its index around currencies around the world. Because other currencies – so the COVID-19 crisis is causing governments and other currencies around the world to fail. And it's slow failure, but it's failing because those currencies were really running very high deficits and very close to the line and, and – to GDP ratios, which are abs absurd. And now the economies have been crippled by COVID-19. They have to print more money. So effectively, Gresham's law kicks in and people start, you know, start, they'll spend that currency, but they're going to start putting their savings into US dollars. So there's this like demand for US dollars globally. And because global money supply is 70 trillion, you print $2 trillion, it doesn't really make a huge impact in, in, in global money supply, especially since most of that is is dollar based or dollar denominated and there's demand for more. So as we see the rest of the world moving towards dollarization, effectively, I think Raul Paul called it that, uh, you, you, the, the inflationary pressure of the dollar is actually very muted at the moment. And they could probably print another two trillion dollars and not see uh, inflation rear its ugly head just yet. So, you know, it's too soon to tell when inflation kicks in. But for now, the dollar is the, the store of value for the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that crypto will ever have the power to displace the dollar as the dominant global currency? Uh, potentially. I think there is potential for it. But like the real question is, is it crypto native, which is like something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, or is it uh, tokenized currency? Because that's two, two very different things, right? Tokenized dollars is not replacing dollars in a sense. It's just moving it to a transportable, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, form factor, right? It's moving from bank accounts to a distributed ledger. It's still the same amount of dollars, whereas something native like Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, is a totally different asset class. What are your thoughts on this, Kyle? Yeah, I'm pretty skeptical that crypto is going to replace the dollar uh, on any time scale. Uh, in, in the event the dollar is not the gold reserve, that is a scary, scary, scary world to live in, and I do not want to live in that world because that transition will be very painful. Um, I think I think crypto can challenge a lot of long tail fiat currencies, but I, I think the dollar is out of the question. How do you see the current COVID nineteen crisis affecting crypto's role in the global economy now and as we move uh, as we potentially move out of the crisis? I think the the kind of there's a few lenses. The big obvious lens is that governments around the world are uh, engaging in large scale um, quantitative easing and they're monetizing their their spending money like crazy and monetizing their debt by printing new money. Um, this is definitely the largest monetary experiment in human history. And um, I'd say it is relatively intuitive that there's a lot of risk here and this could really backfire and just kind of create an inflationary spiral. It has not happened. I'm not saying it will happen, but it is a pretty reasonable conclusion to draw that the, 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 the risk of that happening is increasing by the day. Um, and if that happens, that's probably good for Bitcoin because Bitcoin is, is disinflationary, fixed supply, yada, yada, yada. So I think that's a pretty obvious case for, for, for crypto coming out of this crisis. I think the other ones that are a little more interesting that are more nuanced is looking at 
you know, as consumption patterns change, as travel patterns change, how can you use this technology to kind of ride those trends? So like video is booming, right? Like Zoom and, and all these things are, are blowing up right now. Um, there's some unique crypto enabled technologies such as live peer that make it dramatically cheaper to transcode video at scale. Um, and so like that's very under discussed and we're, we're fortunate to be large investors in live peer. Um, you know, music, right? Like concerts are like in like large scale public gatherings are not gonna be a thing for a while. And so artists are looking for new ways to like new channels for distribution and new ways to remix their work and other artists work. And uh, one of our, uh, and there's companies like Audius that are super focused on trying to kind of facilitate that kind of new um, creative consumption. And so I, I think there's, the, while those aren't nearly the, the same kind of macro scale as, as gold or digital gold, uh, I think there's a lot of kind of tail use cases where crypto is going to be a really powerful enabling new technology. And we're really excited about some of those. Vinny, do you also see COVID-19 as spurring the integration of these more niche uh, use case tokens? Yes and no. I think there's there's definitely be some some of that, and agree with largely what Carl said there. I, I would add that I think COVID nineteen does bring in some concerns around uh, governments being undermined uh, in, in their efforts. So I, imagine this, right? Imagine you have a an isolated economy. Uh, I'll use South Africa for example because I'm South African. Um, imagine that 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 you know, the government's printing money to keep social welfare going because people are, you know, starving right now. The country's in lockdown. It's a total crisis. The IMF's giving them 80 billion rand, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a 500 billion rand stimulus package, about 30, 40 billion dollars, uh, probably less now, the change rate fluctuations. But the, the, the point is um, people there are using the fiat uh, on ramps to go from their local currency into Bitcoin. Okay, or into whatever cryptocurrency they want to to sort of protect their wealth from uh, the, the government's eroding the currency. What happens when the government sees that this is happening in such a large degree that it's undermining their efforts and it's weakening the currency even further and 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 it creates a hyperinflationary sort of spiral, right? Because if everybody, if nobody locally within a, a sort of controlled geography wants the local currency because the government is failing and the economy is in trouble because of COVID-19, uh, governments have to stop the fiat on-ramps into crypto for that market. They, they, they're, they're going to. If they haven't already in some countries, and I know they have, they're going to in other countries the moment they see this far out of control. So it, it is interesting that there's this like uh, barrier, right? So if, if it becomes even slightly too much of a threat for a government, they're going to shut it off in certain countries. Now, that doesn't mean that it, it, it you know globally doesn't have an impact. Um, but it just means in that, that country demand it'll go become a black market currency in, in in those countries. I'm talking about Bitcoin in particular. But it, it is interesting how um, there is probably some sort of limit on what the, I mean. Institutional buyers would just be locked out in that country. Where institutional buyers right now could legally go and buy Bitcoin to hedge themselves against uh, rand devaluation. If the government outlawed it, they just couldn't do it, right? So you'd only have retail buyers and black market traders, and that reduces demand. Uh, you know, for that currency. So it's kind of a weird. I mean, Carl, do, do you, like, what, what do you think? Do you think that? Because I, I kind of think that's what's going to happen in some countries when people start fleeing out of their currency. Yeah, I think that that this kind of global monetary experiment, the first order implication is not the the crumbling of the dollar; it's the crumbling of long tail fiat, and those people are probably going to flee their low currencies for the dollar. Um, yeah. And and so. Uh, that that to me seems like the, the kind of first order impact, and I think Libra is, is, is you know could potentially over the next few years just line up as as the kind of perfect way to, to make, like the perfect actual rails to make that happen. But no, but so the the the, the government start banning Libra, right? Whether it's Libra or Bitcoin, like there's this reflexivity sort of thesis in this, uh, effectively that the more successful these cryptos become against local currencies, the more governments are going to just react viscerally towards it and block it so then it doesn't actually gain traction in that market because of that that reflexivity as we move forward with COVID 19 and from an investor's perspective what do you think is the most important aspect of the crypto space that needs to be developed in order to enable growth of the space i mean i think the the most bullish thing that could happen would be um a large number of the global macro hedge funds saying they bought bitcoin i think the next most bullish thing that could happen would be CPI, consumer CPI um, increasing, which for the last decade it is really not. Um, and I think those two things would, would really drive the, the drive the kind of narrative for, for crypto. At this point, the, the actual market structure is there. The exchanges are there. The fiat on-ramps are there. 
the derivatives markets are there, they're mature, you have futures, you have options, you have spot, you have global access, um, like you have custody, you have prime brokerage, uh, you have banking, like all of the market infrastructure is finally there to support large scale capital inflows. Um, and so uh, I actually feel pretty good that if you know people wanted to move a trillion dollars into crypto, it, it would be doable today with the kind of infrastructure that's there. Uh, what's not there is, is the people recognizing the need for this and why this is why this is a step function better than the kind of technology solutions of the past like gold. Vinny, do you see those same uh, points of growth? I'll add one. I'll add one thing to that. I think what what I think that was still needed is um, you know the scaling of of transactions and transaction fees and cost cost reductions. If you look at uh, Civic Wallet launching soon, you know we're in we're in testing right now, beta testing, and one of the biggest issues we really do have is the cost of Ethereum transactions for stable coins can be quite high, especially in the microtransaction side. Um, and so Ethereum needs to figure out scale, or someone else needs to replace it with a more scalable, cheaper solution. So you know we're obviously backers in Solana. We think Solana's technology is fantastically well suited for this sort of. Uh, environment and but that, this is one of the biggest issues in crypto for over a decade is how do you scale crypto and so until we get to the point where we can scale this so that transactions are throughputs not an issue and costs are, are, are you know reasonably low um, I, I think it's it's one of the difficult things to build use cases in the market right now because how do you how do you use something which is you know 50 or 100 times more expensive than a simple database transaction or even more in some cases mm -hmm. So speaking of development, Kyle, you recently tweeted that over the next 36 months, Asia will become by far the most important market for DeFi and commercialist crypto more broadly. Why do you think Asia will become so important in the crypto space? Um, so, hey, I think Asia is already the most important market for crypto. Um, all the mining is there. Or most of the mining is there. Almost all exchange activity happens in Asia. Um, the substantial majority of retail users today are in Asia. There's not much retail in the U.S. Um, and so I, I think already definitively today, Asia is actually the hub of, of crypto. Um, I think over the next 36 months, I'm really, we've been thinking a lot about DeFi and the growth of DeFi. And I think the problem in the U.S. is the people in the U.S. do not want to opt out of the U.S. dollar. Um, and they don't, they're very happy with Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, you know, the kind of tools they have today. Um, I think the opportunity for, um, DeFi is going to be in serving people who uh, are unhappy with some part of their existing financial services infrastructure, whether it's the currency they have or whether it's the, the surveillance that they're, they're undergoing. Uh, but the, the people who want for some reason to opt out of the current financial, either uh, either fiat regime or either the payment rails themselves, those are the people who DeFi are going to, going to appeal to the most. Uh, and I don't think any of those people basically live in the U.S. I think almost all of those people live uh, in Asia. Um, and so I think with a pretty high degree of confidence that over the next 36 months, e DeFi is going to become just absolutely dumb. Like the, the ratio of DeFi consumption uh, between Asia and the U.S. is, is going to just balloon. Vinny, do you also see Asia becoming the or continuing to be the DeFi hub of the world? So maybe on the on the technical side, that's possible. I, I slightly disagree with Kyle. I think that the, the interest rates that, um, that DeFi can offer would be attractive to people around the world. Uh, and more, even more in the U.S., where interest rates are super low, zero at the moment. Uh, if you could, uh, if people could build safer, uh, more secure, insured smart contracts, for example, uh, where the you know, where, and, and the, the liquidity pools exist already. That, that even with the biggest crisis we had in crypto like last month, you know, there was, given the size of the market, there was relatively few hiccups um, in in the uh, DeFi space, right? Even when the market dropped 20, 30 percent. Uh, you know, in, in a matter of hours. Um, so I think that if you can package good DeFi offerings to consumers, and you, you don't have to call it DeFi. If it's something like, hey, deposit you know, coins, uh, dollars in this in this wallet and 5% annual interest or 8% annual interest, that's appealing to anyone, really. And what they, all they care about is, you know, is it safe? Is it insured? Uh, is it uh, you know, recoverable? Will I lose my money? And how safe is the money? And like, th this is the things that go through consumers' heads. So I think it's more about what is the product offering as opposed to uh, whether or not Asia will win or not. It doesn't matter. Like, if the, pro if the offering is solid and it's global, people around the world will adopt it. Great. Well, thank you guys very much for coming on the show. Uh, I appreciate your insights and the future of crypto looks bright. Thank you guys. Thank you. Hey, Jack, thanks so much for having us on the show. Take care. Thanks, thank you everyone for watching. 
That was Kyle Sumani, co-founder of Multicoin Capital, and Vinny Lingham, CEO at Civic. My name is Jackson, and if you guys enjoyed the video, hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.